Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the late night stream. Now, usually we don't do streams this late. Usually we don't do streams actually during the week, but uh, this is a special occasion. What I want to talk to you tonight about is this gentleman right here, Jamie Diamond, who is the CEO of JP Morgan. And before we get into this, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, well, first, I have to say this. I apologize if you hear anything in the background. Those are called koki. They are the frogs here in Puerto Rico. And they make this uh, noise constantly in the evening, and I really can't control that. Now, I've got a noise dampening on, but if you hear a little bit, it may sound a little bit squeaky. Sorry, can't do much about that. The reason why I want to talk to you about this, we're going to talk about this. We're also going to talk about the court case of the coin, of Coinbase versus the SEC and how the first day was, in my personal opinion, a loss of another L for the SEC. But I wanted to bring this to everybody's attention because these are the things that, as we move forward into this next bull cycle, Bitcoin halving is coming up. I think we roughly got 92 days. Correct me in the comments section. And there's going to be a lot of people asking you a lot of questions. And some of the questions that are going to come about are the same thing that Jamie Dimon is going to talk about. And it's a misconception about what he says. It's a masterclass in FUD. And I need you to be on board with the things to say back when people ask you, because let's be honest, uh, it's up to us to educate everybody. And you know that's just really how it goes. Now, this is, uh, there's four little parts to this, and we'll go over those in, in detail, but this is the first section. So Jamie Dimon here is on uh, CNBC, and he's talking about Bitcoin, his favorite topic. So uh, just take a listen, and uh, we'll go from This is like a couple of seconds or so, 30 seconds or so. I re this is the last time I've ever talked about this on CNBC. Okay? <laughs> first of all, he said, this is the last time I'm going to talk about Bitcoin and CNBC. This is like the 10th time he said it. He's going to say it like three more times. Just be ready. So help me God. <laughs> Blockchain is real. It's a technology. We use it. It's going to move money. It's going to move data. It's efficient. We've been talking about that for 12 years, too, and it's very small. Okay, so I think we've wasted too many words in that. Cryptocurrencies, there are two types. There's a cryptocurrency which might actually do something. Think of a cryptocurrency as an embedded smart contract right. in it, and that we can use it buy and sell real estate and move data. That may have value. The idea of tokenizing. Things. Tokenizing things that, that you do something with. And then there's one which does nothing. I call it the pet rock the Bitcoin or something like that. <laughs> so, so, okay. So first of all, he's right. Yeah. When he talks about it, he goes, there are certain cryptos that don't do anything. Let's just be honest. They are supposed to do things and they don't. And there's some things that actually uh, do actually work. There is over a thousand different cryptos out there and some of them are just pretty much worthless. So on this one, I got to give it to Jamie. He is right. Now, when he talks about, you know, these, you know, Bitcoin doesn't work, it's kind of ridiculous. But again, when we're, when we're, talking about the things that actually work, it's really tough to distinguish between like real world, not just real world assets, but what actually is competing and doing things in the world. Now, there was a video that I did over on my second channel. It's Dan Degen. This is where I talk about the more risky stuff uh, outside of the top 300. And we just talked about this new um, project that's coming to light called IvanPay. I like this one because it has real world use case. It's going to allow all the different business to business, business to consumers to actually take crypto or digital assets and you be able to pay for that wherever you are. And it doesn't matter what kind of wallet you have or anything else is going to come. It's going to pretty much be like an aggregator and put everything together. And oh, yeah, this is on uh, Tencent, the launch pad. And uh, you've got four days to, to take a look at that before it launches. So there's a link in the description. So when we're talking about things that actually work, these are one of the things that I think actually works. And then before we go on, as a reminder, uh, JP Morgan, he, Jamie's the CEO, and he's had quite a, a troubled history with Bitcoin. We just remember where he's come from. In 2015, he said a virtual currency will be stopped. And then JP Morgan CEO says it's a fraud. And he says, okay, well, maybe the technology behind it's pretty good. And then he says, it's not my cup of, cup of tea, even though JP Morgan has warmed to crypto. And then 20, uh, 2021, JP Morgan says investors should make or could make 1% of portfolios. And they talk about managing Bitcoin fund. And then, of course, they're also in the Bitcoin ETF. So it's a troubled history, but it's one that's uh, not uncommon, especially with traditional finance as they come into play. So the next part, as we get uh, deeper into this little rabbit hole, is what Jamie talks about as far as the normal stuff. And you're going to hear this same thing. It's going to be about illicit activity. There's going to be problems that comes up. So just take a listen. This is how to uh, rebuke that. And so on the Bitcoin, you know, there's first of all, and I'm, I'm not trying to make a joke here. There are use cases, AML, fraud, anti-money laundering, 
tax avoidance, sex trafficking. Those are real use cases. And you see it being used for hundreds, maybe 50, 100 billion dollars a year for that. That is the end use case. Everything else is people train among themselves. All right. So I love this one because uh, Elizabeth Warren does the same thing. Senator Elizabeth Warren says, you know, this is just all illicit activity. You know what's the best use or the best uh, medium of exchange for illicit activity? It's the U.S. dollar. I mean, I hate to say it, but that's exactly what it is. So when we're talking about this, you're going to get the same thing because the people that you talk to, they're going to hear the same nonsense out of somebody like Jamie Dimon or somebody like Warren Buffett or somebody like Elizabeth Warren. And they're going to just parrot that and say, hey, are this is used for like massive illicit activity. So, so what gives here? Because I don't really understand. So just remind them that there was this report in 2021 and it came out by Michael Morrill. Michael Morrill is a janitor. Some, no, I'm just kidding. Michael Morrill, is the, he was the director of the CIA, director of intelligence of the CIA. And he did a deep analysis in 2021. And the conclusion was quite simple. He said this, it's really just two pieces. The broad generalization about the use of Bitcoin illicit finance are significantly overstated. Yes, it does happen, but it's significantly overreached. The blockchain ledger on which Bitcoin transactions are recorded is an underutilized forensic tool that can be used more widely by law enforcement and the intelligence community to identify and disrupt illicit activities. Look, I haven't worked for the cartel for years. And I got to tell you, just kidding. But if you're going to do anything with like illicit activity, the worst place you can possibly do that is on a public ledger for everything to be actually uh, uncovered. And it didn't work too well for different parts of terrorism and other different parts of finance. So again, this is a masterclass in FUD. I'm just trying to uh, inform everybody about what to come back with. So we're on that. And then there was another great question that was asked here. And I thought that was pretty interesting because you know, Larry Fink has come out and, uh, you know, runs the largest asset manager, which is BlackRock with uh, nine to 10 trillion assets under management. And when he came out and he said, you know what, I think we're going to do a Bitcoin ETF. And of course, I was uh, like, I don't think that's actually going to happen. It did. Now, here we are. But the question was asked to Jamie, which was, well, what do you think now? Because, I mean, your buddy, Larry Fink comes out and supports Bitcoin. So where are you on this piece? So we're going to fast forward to uh, right here. Let's hear what he has to say. What do you and make of so what, what do you make of the other firms, the Black Rocks of the world that that obviously and, and Larry, Larry Fink <laughs> changed his view of this, obviously. Yeah. And maybe he changed his view because you think he genuinely believes in Bitcoin or genu or believed it because he thinks that there's a marketplace for it and he wants to be part of that market. But what do you think of the and there's a, about a dozen big financial companies? Fidelity no, included. No, number one, I don't care. So just please stop talking about this shit. First of all, he does care. And he's getting a little bit uh, heated, which I understand because it's tough to be wrong all the time. Trust me, I know. Ask my wife. So like all these things that he's saying, just take it with a grain of salt. And <laughs> and I don't know what he would say about blockchain versus currencies that do something versus Bitcoin that does nothing. And maybe that not different than me. But you know, this is what makes a market. People have opinions. I, this is the last time I'm ever going to state my opinion. Gold really. <laughs> the last time. He's such a bull. He's a bull. Look, I have nothing against uh, Jamie Dimon. Very successful gentleman. Runs, you know, a multi-billion dollar bank. And and uh, he's right here. You know, that's what makes the, the world go around. So that's what makes markets actually work. So on that, on that, wall, that one part, I just wanted to say that even though we have the backing of some of the largest institutions that are out there, it's like some people just kind of pass over like, ah, eh, they're just crazy or ah, they're just doing this thing or whatever else, but they're just not really open their eyes. And that's just kind of how it is. And some people will say, well, Jamie Dimon's just a liar and he's just doing everything behind the scenes possibly, but you know, it is what it is. And the last piece we're going to talk about, and this is going to be a good question that's going to come up, which is, hey, um, can't Bitcoin just be changed? Because I mean, 21 million, why well, they just changed that? It's just code, right? And this is something that you really need to understand because when people ask you this question, you're, you're going to stumble through and like, well, it's a decentralized it's Nakamoto and white paper method transmission. You're like, what are you talking about? So I want to kind of drill this in. So just take a listen to what uh, Jamie has asked here, and then uh, we'll go over the answer to the foot. They didn't do anything either. Yeah, but gold's limited in the supply. So it's Bitcoin. And it's been used... Uh, so you think so, huh? I do. I think there's a good chance that when Bitcoin, when we get to that 20 to million Bitcoins, million, that, to 42. No, that Satoshi's going to come on there, laugh hysterically, 
go quiet, all Bitcoin's going to be erased. I think, man. How the hell do you know it's going to stop at 21? I've, I've never met one person who told me they know for a fact they take that mathematically as, it's it, it, it's not it how's, can't happen because how's, by the last one will be you, mined in 2150 and it, it it gets harder and harder every time there's another halving but but jamie it, I mean, look, looking you guys, back you guys over do what you want i'll do what i want I as for it. gold you can the, the six characteristics that make gold valuable for four thousand years they're yeah. all present in bitcoin that's all i'll say and i love you and i don't want to you, you, and i also don't i don't also don't want to be a you, you may joe, joe you may be right yeah I, I don't own gold either, so okay. Uh, that's what I mean. A couple, couple of quick final questions. I like to own things that pay me incomes. Uh, it we, doesn't cost money to carry. Anyway, and it costs money to carry Bitcoin too, by the way. We've so. talked a lot. <laughs> He's so full. It doesn't cost any money to carry Bitcoin, but fine. A lot about yeah. commercial real estate uh, here uh, in Davos. There was a big 60 Minutes piece on, on Sunday. And oh, yeah, but I think there's another risk to Bitcoin. If, if you can't solve the bad use cases, the government's probably going to have to close it down. So that the, the thing about so, the money laundering, you, you can you think, look at, here's it, the the number was twenty thousand, I think, for U.S. dollar for dollars in money laundering, and it was thirty five for how much is done with Bitcoin. So at this point, the do, but ran, the do, the dominant but, is I know, but the dominant you know about historically the dominant currency for money laundering has been U.S. I, I well, thank God for Joe saying it. I, I got to appreciate that. So there's a lot of lots of break. <laughs> there's a lot to break down there, and again, the question always comes up. Well. You know, it's 21 million. That's 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 its best use case right there. I mean, not the best use case, but that's that's the whole value proposition for Bitcoin. So if it's made if it's made as a as software, can we just change that software? You can. In all honesty, you can. So when people ask you this question, like, well, how do you know it's going to be 21 million forever? Because can we just change that? I can go in there. I can I can make a Bitcoin on a coin. I can do whatever I want to. This is why that's wrong. So. There's a great website. I link this in the description. It's called RiverLearn. And I need everybody to understand this to a T. And sometimes even I get this a little bit jumbled up about node operators and miners and who actually controls the network. So we're going to go through this real quick. So when someone asks you this question, you can answer it a little bit more thoroughly. So can Bitcoin's hard cap of 21 million be changed? First of all, there's never going to be more than 21 million. It could happen, but it's not. I'm going to tell you why. It's, in, it's encoded in Bitcoin source code and enforced by nodes on the network. What is a node on the network? Well, if you want to uh, download and be a node operator, there's a link in the description and you can download and become your own node operator. You just download this Bitcoin core and you run it on your computer. Now, you're going to need, uh, depending on if you do a full node or if you're going to be a pruned node, pruned node, it's between 500 gigabytes and one terabyte or a lot less if you're doing a prune node. But regardless, you have everything on your computer. That's what a node operator does. It essentially it validates the blocks. It's not the miners. So critics claim that since Bitcoin is nothing more than software, the rules of the Bitcoin network can be changed easily, which is what I heard when I first got into. Miners are the actors who may have the strongest motivation to change Bitcoin's hard cap. I got to disagree actually on this one because yes, they do mine Bitcoin, but look how much they're making right now just mining with ordinals and just doing not too much and just processing those transactions. Some days it's more than uh, Ethereum. So on, on that, I think there's a, there's a longevity case to be, to be made. But if they did do this and go against it, that would destroy a core investment thesis, which is scarcity. Removing the fundamental driver behind Bitcoin's value proposition is not in the miner's best interest or anybody's best interest. Why? Even if, and we'll get to this in a second, even if BlackRock came out and said, you know what? We'd like to uh, increase Bitcoin's mass amount, max amount from 21 million to 42 million. Well, now you just dropped everything in half. Why would you do that? Because you want to issue more, more Bitcoin? You could, but the whole value proposition is that it's not scarce. It's not scarce. Gold is scarce. We're still going to find more. Bitcoin is finite, not infinite. It's finite. It's only 21 million. That's it. That's all, that's all it's ever going to be. So here's, the, the distinction, miners do not control the network or its rules. Let me say that again. Miners don't control the network or its rules. Miners produce new blocks, validate transactions. Well, miners submit a new block in the network, tens of thousands of nodes each independently verify this block. Nodes will reject all blocks that violate these rules, meaning miners have no control over Bitcoin's rule set. So in recourse, a little relapse here. Miners are great. They don't control the network per se. They can all work together and they can fork and all these things, but they don't control the network is the nodes. So 
this theory has been validated by reality when in 2017, I had no idea, I had forgot about this. But in 2017, 95% of miners agreed to raise the block size limit in an attempt to allow Bitcoin to scale. Nodes and users, however, refused this change and successfully forced miners to adopt an alternative scaling solution. So this is how Bitcoin's hard cap could be changed. Then it actually could happen. But I'm going to tell you why it's not going to happen. First, developers have to propose and write the new code. That's one. Next, the community have to agree to activate the path. That means that all the nodes on the network would have to adopt the change or be forced on the network. I believe that's not true. I believe it's a, a majority, which would be 51% of all the nodes on the network would have to adapt the changes or be forced on the network. That would be called a fork. Both miners and nodes, both miners and nodes, miners and nodes would signal their support for the change. And how do they signal that support? Well, they would update their software and they would download the uh, correct application because there's no voting. It's just downloading and that would signal that you want to do something new, like go from 21 to 42 million, which would be dumb. And once a dominant portion of the network signals support, the change would be activated. However, I will say this, but people will say, well, Rob, what about Bitcoin Cash? And what about Bitcoin SV? And what about Bitcoin Gold? First of all, no one knows about Bitcoin Gold. That's a long time ago. Here's the thing. They may change different aspects of that, but look at all three of them. They're all 21 million for Bitcoin SV, 21 million for Bitcoin Cash, and even Bitcoin Gold is still a 21 million. So again, if you're going to get this question to say, it could happen, but all the nodes or a majority of the nodes have to all agree. And I'm just going to tell you right now, a lot of these, a lot of these nodes are not up to date with everything that they actually should be. It's just how it is. And you'll figure it out if you ever download this and actually use it. And on top of that, you know how many nodes are out there in the world right now? There's 16,635 nodes. You're going to tell me you're going to get 8,000 plus to, to signal or 9,000 plus to go, yeah, let's go to 42 million or 50 million or whatever else it is. It's not going to happen. And then lastly, before we move on to the next piece of the SEC uh, versus Coinbase, I found this part quite funny here. Not here, actually. Da, da, da. Oh, here. So as they were debating against gold, somebody in the uh, staff of CNBC threw up the Bitcoin chart and the gold chart as Jamie was talking, which I found was was quite hilarious because if you take a look at uh, you know gold, this is this is the uh, uh, GC.1 CEC Commodities Exchange, which is where they're pulling this information from, and you can see that it's pretty much flat, which is I I think kind of eh, it's kind of kind of funny. And then also, I thought it'd be better if uh, if they would have thrown up the JP Morgan Chase stock right behind them and then compared that to Bitcoin and see how it's doing for a year to date. That's good. Or actually, so I'm oh, sorry, we should go for a year. Still, still out outperforming 22% versus 105%. Just saying. So anyhow, let me just think about that in the comment section. And lastly, before we get to the Q&A part, uh, Coinbase and the SEC. That's just, uh, this was the first day. This happened in the New York District uh, uh, court case. And here's what's happening. So it's the SEC's claim against Coinbase. It alleges that uh, 13 cryptos or more, I would say, are all securities. The list includes tokens like Solana, Cardano, and Polygon, which I think this is, this is why this is such a big case right now. This is why everybody's covering it. So just to paraphrase what happened, you could have actually listened to this live, and which is pretty cool. I didn't know that was actually happening. But it all came down to this. Coinbase first SEC, the judge says we need new laws for the crypto market. The old 90-year Howey test should not apply to the current market. And then SEC is getting smoked. This is bullish for crypto. Could be. We'll see. This is also from Eleanor Terrett. She's on in Fox Business. And she says, to, to paraphrase, the SEC lawyer said the Congress in 1934 will be surprised that today there will be such an easy workaround the carefully constructed regulatory structure they created in 1934 with regards to the market. Coinbase contends that SEC has failed to prove that the 12 issuers of the tokens and questions made any statements or actions that could be interpreted as engages in contractional obligation. And then lastly, Paul says, look, the SEC and Paul is the chief legal officer at Coinbase. The SEC cannot unilaterally expand and redefine its own regulatory ambit. This should be left up to Congress and the ongoing legislative discussions about regulatory frameworks. And that's actually what the judge asked as well. As she came back and said, this is Judge uh, uh, Fila. She's, I think I said that right. Nailed it. 
She asked the SEC counsel why she shouldn't listen to Senator Lummis about dismissing the case. And then she says, she's not just a random senator. She's someone deeply involved in the space. Why is she wrong? The SEC lawyer says, a senator's opinion shouldn't be able to overrule 90 years of securities. And she says, well, we had a good run. We had 90 years when these securities laws have been able to apply to these markets, but now we have something new. So again, I don't think this is going to go the way the SEC thought, just the same way that they it didn't go the same way that they thought it would go for Ripple. And now here they are in another case, and it's just like uh, the L's are just kind of uh, stacking up. We'll see how it works out, but I got to tell you, it's looking pretty good for the lawyers that are, or Paul and Coinbase and everybody else, and also looks good for investors such as ourselves. But that's it for tonight. So look, wow, we went long, 20 minutes. If you liked today's video, late night, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive.